to our very first meeting for Sawmill Society, the Concaston Memorial Lecture. We really appreciate you all being here and it's an honour for us to have our very first meeting of the year to remember our past president, Con Caston, and co-founder of the Sawmill Society. Tonight we're very fortunate um, to have Amelia Brown here to, well, to introduce our guest speaker, Estelle Stresdens. Um, and I must say, as I said earlier, I think your subject sounds fascinating. Thank you very much for joining us tonight and I'll hand you over to Amelia to do a formal introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Francine. I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Estelle Strastens, who joined the Department of Classics and Ancient History uh, four years ago? Three? Two? Oh my god. Two years ago. Two years ago, which feels like four. <laughs> uh, because it's been a very busy two years, as you can all imagine. Uh, and Estelle is a fantastic colleague who is teaching in Greek history um, from the Archaic through the Hellenistic era. She holds a DPhil from Oxford and she also has her bachelor and master's degree from the University of Melbourne and she's from Melbourne uh, but uh, living with us here in Brisbane now. Uh, she also is the author of numerous publications, both uh, articles uh, about uh, Greece in the Roman Imperial era and before and after. Her most recent article, which I can't wait to read, is called Herodes Atticus and the Sanctuaries of Achaea. Uh, about uh, all of the uh, uh, massive buildings that Herodes Atticus put up, especially the Herodes Atticus uh, Theatre in Athens, which some of you might be familiar with, but also his patronage of Olympia um, and, uh, and other sites. Her forthcoming monograph is Fashioning the Future in Roman Greece, and it brings together some of the research that she's going to share here tonight, research on Roman Imperial Greece, uh, second sophistic authors, especially Pausanias, author of the Ancient Guidebook to Greece, and the medieval and early modern, and in fact modern, travelers to Greece. Uh, her expertise also includes art, archaeology, architecture, literature, and history. And she's very experienced too in leading students on trips in Greece uh, with both the British School at Athens and the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens. Uh, so I'm very glad to introduce her and uh, I can't wait to hear about after marathon. Excellent. Um, well, first up, I would just like, I'm very grateful for having been invited to come and talk to you. Um, I understand that um, Con was a lecturer in English at the University of Queensland where I've been for the past two years. It's been such a great experience and I'm really honoured that you've invited me to come and give his memorial lecture. Um, I, like him, am really, really interested in Australian Greek literature and literature of Greek diasporas in general. So I'm, I'm very, very honoured that you've invited me to come and talk. So thank you very much. So what I am going to talk to you about today is after marathon. And what I really mean by this is this idea that um, marathon is this really important symbolic battle that, that changes um, the, the notions of kind of East and West and, and what culture really means to Greeks and all these sorts of things. And that people who um, come to the plane of marathon after the battle are really interesting kind of to try to get at the notions of marathon through the topography, through, through the landscape itself. So I want to explore how the cultural notions surrounding the Battle of Marathon have repeatedly shaped kind of responses to physical remains there, um, focusing especially on early Western European travellers and the Soros or the Tomb of the Athenians in the Plain of Marathon. And there's really no better place to start um, than with this particular lithograph that you see here. So this was produced by a Frenchman during the Greek War of Independence. Um, and what it shows you here is um, a ghost. So this here is the ghost of Miltiades, so the great general at Marathon, the Athenian general. And he's um, come here and he's talking to this guy here who um, some commentaries say that this is a Turkish soldier or perhaps a Greek soldier and he's saying to him, remember Marathon and pointing down to the Bay of Marathon. So it's this 
idea that um, in, during the Greek War of Independence that um, whether you're a Greek soldier or a Turkish soldier, that you have to be aware of the idea of marathon and all it means for Greek freedom. So it's kind of a nice way to start, I think. So he's, he's for telling, the ghost of Miltiades is here for telling the, um, the victory, the coming victory of the Greeks and of Greek freedom. So actually tapping into that symbolism of these greatly outnumbered um, Athenian and Plataean soldiers who fought off the, the hordes of Eastern Persians who are coming to take their freedom away. And it sort of taps into everything Western Europeans at the time, when they were coming in the 17th to 19th centuries, um, really held dear about their own culture in many ways. So they were kind of tapping into that tradition. Now the significance of the Battle of Marathon, of course, um, identified and sh was identified and shaped by Athenians pretty much immediately um, after the battle. And it became this kind of defining event for Athenian identity. Um, what I have here is a poem, not by an Athenian, but by um, Xenophanes of Colophon. Um, but this really kind of taps into the cultural impact of the Persian Wars um, and what they, the impact they had more broadly on um, Greeks in the Greek-speaking world. So it really imagines that you're sitting by the fire um, when you hear a knock at the door. And it says, in winter, on your soft couch by the fire, full of food, drinking sweet wine and cracking nuts, this is how you should address the chance stranger at your door. What's your name, my good friend? Where do you live? How many years can you number? How old were you when the Persians came? Okay, so the poet is kind of assuming that um, the Persian wars is an event that everyone can relate to. It's sort of like, you know, where were you when man landed on the moon, when JFK was shot, when Diana died? These kind of ideas. So it's a pivotal moment that affected um, the Greek world, affected everyone in the Greek world, um, and kind of unites the culture in a way. So something so momentous that everyone knows about it and can remember where they were at that time. And this kind of, this idea um, that this, this sort of cultural potency um, of Marathon drew early Western European travellers to the plain of Marathon once they started coming to Greece in any kind of number. And it was really from the mid 17th century onwards. So I'm going to focus on their interaction in particular with the mound, with the Soros or the tomb of the Athenians at Marathon. And as they were kind of, they were trying to look for concrete signs of this battle that happened, you know, 2,000 years before or so. They wanted to find real signs of it. So they came with this sort of cultural longing, and the Soros was, was a focus of that. So these early travellers came, and they had this classical education. So they had come to know Greece first and foremost through its literature. Um, the Hellenic spirit was thought to reside in the poems of Homer, the histories of Herodotus, of Thucydides, of Xenophon, the philosophy of Plato, and the tragedies of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. So these are kind of the authors that they were reading. They were also though, reading this sort of post-classical text, so these texts from the Roman period, like Pausanias' description of Greece or Strabo's geography. Um, and although these weren't really valued as literature, um, they did sort of shape European imaginations and what to expect of the actual real landscape of Greece when they arrived there. So it made them think about what the physical Greek landscape might be like and what its traditions were like. So when they arrived in Greece, they had these pre-existing ideas of what Greece should be like and what they should find. And this had come from these, the pages of these books. Um, and they were quite well developed and quite set. So, Early travellers expected to find a landscape that was just full of the classical past when they arrived. So the early 19th century Irish antiquarian traveller and artist Edward Dodwell's attitude is typical in this. I um, mean, you can see this in his passage from this passage from his classical and topographical tour, um, and this is published in 1819, and it talks about his experience of Athens and the kind of how the physical reality of Athens was sort of was um, enhanced by his cultural imagination. So he says, 
walking over the ashes of demigods and heroes and in treading the same ground that they have trod before, the force of association contributes to revive their identity in the mind and to transfer it to the surrounding objects. They live in the imagination. Their presence is breathed over the hills and rocks. It haunts the dells and the groves and animates every part of the panoramic view. The whole locality is consecrated by the memory of statesmen and warriors, of historians and poets, of critics and philosophers, sages and legislators, of whom not only Athens, but the whole world may be proud. So you see here in Sight Will's strong investment in the idea that the landscape is haunted, haunted by the classical past, and that ruins of the classical past are acting almost as time machines that can, where you can communicate between the past and the present. So that where the modern European can kind of communicate with the ancient Athenian in a way. So this is the attitude that these travelers kind of brought when they tried to find the classical layers of Greek, Greece in the modern Greek landscape. So before we look at some of the travel responses to Mar Marathon, it's probably a good idea to have a quick review of the battle itself. And this is what, what we're told by Herodotus of what happens in the battle. Okay. So he tells us that um, Hippias, who was the son of the tyrant Pisistratus, who had been um, kicked out of Athens, actually is the one who brings the Persians to land at Marathon. So he's the one who takes them there. And then the Athenian forces are led out by their ten generals to go and meet them, and a messenger is sent to Sparta to try and get reinforcements to help them. Okay. Athens is then joined by a force from the neighbouring, well, the, from the Boeotian city of Plataea nearby. Um, then the Athenians kind of debate about whether they should fight or not. Um, and the vote to fight or the vote not to fight becomes tied. Um, and Miltiades, who is you know, the main general, kind of urges Callimachus, who um, is in charge, the, the guy who's in charge of kind of all of the generals, to vote to fight because he has this sort of deciding vote. And he says to him, and he, he, he tries to um, convince him in kind of really, in cultural terms that are quite familiar to us. So he says, Callimachus, it's now in your hands to enslave Athens or make her free, and thereby leave behind for all posterity a memorial such as, as such as not even Harmodius and Aristogain left. So you know they are the tyrant slayers. So now the Athenians have come to their greatest danger since they first came into being, and if we surrender, it's clear what we will suffer. But if the city prevails, it will take first place amongst the Hellenic cities. Okay. So there's kind of a real, or a kind of modern sentiment to that. Okay, so the Athenians debate, battle, they, um, Callimachus is convinced by this, so battle is engaged. The Athenians then attack. Um, their centre fails, but the wings are successful, the Persians are then routed in the march. So we actually don't know a lot about what happens in this battle, but from our best um, estimate of it, um, the centre line of the Athenians kind of falls back, but the wings form around the, the Persians and they um, push them into the march. And, it's all over, <clears throat> basically. And we're told 6,400 Persians are killed, but only 192 Athenians. Um, and the Persians run away and Greece is saved. So that's a basic sort of summary of the battle. Um, and then finally the Spartans turn up. So the Spartans, you know, were, the whole time the Athenians were fighting, the Spartans were on their way and then they turn up at the end of the battle. So they actually end up being the first kind of post-battle tourists. So they're first people to come to the site and to be able to look at it, because they want to see the Persian dead. So they, they're almost treated like a tourist site to some degree, to see this great deed of the Athenians. So this is a map of Marathon, and it's from um, James George Fraser's, the great anthropologist, his commentary on Pausanias's description of Greece, so his guidebook of Greece. Um, and it shows you the Bay of Marathon here, and this little outspur here called Kynosura, or the dog's tail, um, and then the marsh where the Persians perished. And here's the plain of Marathon where the battle probably took place. And down here is the lab labeled the Sauros, or the tomb of the Athenians. Okay, so this is where the Athenian dead um, were buried, or so they think. So this map, map comes from 1898. 
So Marathon, because of all these kind of cultural connotations, was really a favourite destination of Western European travellers when they first started coming to Greece, when they were looking for the classical Greece and the modern Greek landscape. The journey from Athens, though, was not always easy or even necessarily safe. Um, so in 1776, the Englishman Richard Chandler published his travels in Greece, and this detailed a trip made about 10 years earlier at the pest of the Society of the Dilettanti. And Chandler is always, in his, in his writings, he's always very concerned for his own safety and comfort. And when he went to Marathon, he was really worried about wolves. So and he tells us that the region abounds in wolves. Several large and fierce dogs guarded us, and at intervals barked vehemently and ran together in, in, in a troop, as it were, to an attack or to repel some wild beast from their charge. So this is the kind of thing that he is concerned about when he comes to Marathon. Um, Dodwell, Edmund Dodwell, comes a little bit later, and he has a different kind of danger. So he, his danger is like one of potential seduction. So he tells us, you know, that Marathon is one of the prettiest spots in Attica. And it's enriched with many kinds of fruit, many kinds of fruit trees, particularly walnuts, figs, pomegranates, pears and cherries. On our arrival, the fine country girls with attractive looks and smiling faces brought us baskets of fruit. Some of them appeared unwilling to accept our money in return, and the spontaneous civility and good humour of that inhabitant soon convinced us that we were in Attica. Where they're more courteous, where they're more courteous to strangers than in any other part of Greece. So I'm not sure if that's your experience of modern Greece, that the people of Athens and Attica are the more, most, most courteous. But this is what Dogwall found when he went there. But things could also get quite serious. So Lord Muncaster um, in 1870 also went out to visit Marathon, um, and he was with an English and Italian party. Um, there was also a few children with them, and they left Athens to go to Marathon. But they were captured by brigands, and they were going to be ransomed for about £32,000. Um, so, you know, it was quite dangerous sometimes to go to Marathon. Um, the captives drew lots to carry a message back to try and get the ransom organised. Um, and a young Englishman won the lot, but he deferred to Lord Muncaster, and he gave him his his lot and Lord Muncaster went back to um, Athens to try and sort things out. Um, and during the, neg the negotiations, the Greek authorities, um, in defiance of a promise that they made to the English, decided that they would attack um, and that ended with, in the death of all the hostages. So, you know, this poor young guy who swapped places with Lord Muncaster ends up being killed um, due to the actions of Greek authorities. And this kind of, this was an international incident that almost led to war, but um, things, they managed to kind of smooth things over in the end. And the brigands were captured, so this is um, from 1870, from the London, the Illustrated London News. Um, this is the Greek brigands being brought to trial in Athens. And this is another um, scene from another newspaper in 1870 showing you the, and the title is the scene of the recent Greece ma Greek massacre at Marathon. So what you can see here is they're showing you the Marathon plain and they're showing you the Soros, the mound, the tomb of the Athenians as being kind of the recognisable thing about this plain, the thing that everyone knows. So should a traveller actually make it to Marathon unscathed? It was Pausanias' 2nd century AD description of Greece, this guidebook that he wrote in the Roman period, that um, the traveller used as their guide. So nothing else like Pausanias' text survives from antiquity, and no text that describes topography has been so influential on the exploration and study of Greece in the modern era. So Pausanias was from Asia Minor, and he came to mainland Greece um, to kind of delineate the traditions and the culture and the ruins of Greece in the landscape. So he was kind of quite selective and he interpreted what he saw and then he would try and teach people about what it was that he was seeing. So he's trying to give like an informed understanding of the cultural landscape of Greece as it appeared to him in the Roman imperial period. Now, in his text, it's um, Greece itself, its history, its ruins, its art, its ritual that really star. 
Um, and he, came, he kind of engages in this kind of art historical description of artifacts that he encounters. Um, so he'll you know, describe them and classify them in various ways. Um, but he uses them mostly as touchstones to then talk about rituals and traditions. So he'll say, oh, there's a statue of so-and-so in the Agora, but let me actually tell you about that person. So it's more about connecting the stories of Greece to artifacts and, and buildings in the landscape. In a way. So he'll bring up an object to tell a story about it, essentially. And he kind of interprets what he sees in the landscape on the page that he's writing on um, and creates like this this text that's a museum of, of everything, of all things Hellenic, of Hellenism. And it really becomes this kind of paradigm of um, reception of the, the Greek landscape for um, Western European travellers. So it's what they use as the God, there's a way of, like, of even just approaching the landscape when they come to Greece. Now, partly the reliance on Pausanias comes from the failure of local Greeks to explain the landscape in classical terms, right? So the Europeans want to hear about the landscape as though it were classical Greece. Um, so the modern Greeks tend to, they don't really show the European travellers what they want to see. And Dodwell, again, kind of can, gives us a representing view. So he says, you know, a traveller must not expect to derive any information whatever from the generality of Greeks upon the antiquities of their country, but must extricate himself as well as he can from the dark maze of conjecture and uncertainty by the topographical light of Pausanias and by a few scattered materials of other source authors. Right, so you can't trust a modern Greek guide, you have to go to the, to, to the Roman Greek um, writer Pausanias to be able to find your way around. So what does Pausanias actually say about Marathon? It's probably hard for you to see with the lights, but hopefully it's not too bad. Um, so he outlines the kind of monumental landscape, focusing first on the tomb of the Athenians, on the Sauros. So he says, There's a dean called Marathon, equally distant from Athens and Charistus and Euboea, and it was at this point in Attica that the foreigners landed, were defeated in battle, and lost some of their vessels as they were putting off from the land. On the plain is the grave of the Athenians, and upon it there, is, there are pillars, um, giving the names of the dead according to their tribes. And there's another grave for the Boeotians and for the slaves, because slaves, slaves fought for the first time by the side of their masters. There's also a separate monument to the man Miltiades, the son of Chimon, although his end came later. And at Marathon every night, you can hear horses neighing and men fighting. No one who has expressly set himself to behold this vision has ever got any good from it, but the spirits are not wroth with those who, um, in ignorance, chance to be spectators. Okay, so he tells us that Marathon is haunted by the ghosts of the, the people who fought here. Um, the, Marathon, the Marathonians worship both those who died in the fighting, calling them heroes, and secondly, secondly Marathon, from whom the parish derives its name, and then Heracles, saying that they were the first among the Greeks to acknowledge him as a god. There's also a trophy of white marble, and although the Athenians assert that they buried the Persians, because it's always you know, correct to bury, the Pers to bury anyone who's died, I couldn't find their grave. Um, there wasn't a mound nor trace, nor any other trace to be seen, as the dead were carried to a trench probably and thrown in any which way. So when he describes it, he kind of focuses on the, the physical items in the landscape that give kind of a, a definite idea that the battle took place there. So he talks about the, the tomb, the Soros, he talks about Miltiades, he talks about the trophy, the point where the, the Persians turned around and ran away. And he tells us that Marathon is haunted. So this is what the travellers are expecting to find when they get to Marathon, and it's what they're really looking for. And the Soros is kind of the focal point. So um, Chandler made his trip like roughly a decade before he published his work in 1776. Um, and he tells us that um, the plane is, you know, he, he describes the plane. He says it's long and narrow, as you can see. Um, it's opposite to the range of mountains and the, the, the village is by the sea. Um, he says that the mountain of Pantelli is at the kind of the limit of it. And at the other end, there's a, um, a ridge with an isthmus, 
called the Kaimsura or the dog's tail. And then beyond this is a marsh or a lake from which a stream issued. He um, says that the soil is really fertile and that it grows really thick and luxuriant um, corn and that they call the corn um, Archelaean because it's so tall, so naming it after the, the hero Achilles. So you can see how he's already interpreting the plains through the ancient past. So he's trying to, you know, describe it as though he were partly in the, in the classical past, partly in the present, walking around the plain. And then he continues by directly engaging um, the landscape through Pausanias' text. So he says, many centuries have elapsed since the age of Pausanias, but the principal barrow, it's likely that of the gallant Athenians, still towers above the level of the plain. It's of light fine earth and has a bush or two growing on it. I enjoyed a pleasing and satisfactory view from the summit and looked in vain for the pillars on which the names were recorded, so the names of the dead, um, lamenting that such a memorial should ever be removed. At a small distance northward is a square basement of white marble, perhaps part of the trophy. A Greek church has stood near it and some stones and rubbish disposed so as to form an open place of worship. Um, and these remain. The other barrows mentioned by Pausanias are, as probable, among those extant near Brauron. And when he says Brauron, he really means Brana, which is where the modern museum is, the, the Museum of Antiquities. Okay, so he kind of he goes with Pausanias and tries to pick out these things as he's walking around. And the Tomb of the Athenians is the most um, prevalent one. So this is um, what's been identified as the Tomb of the Plataeans at Brana, just near the museum, the Museum of Marathon. So that's one of the other mounds that he sees. And this is looking from roughly where the museum is out into the plain, where you can see the, the, um, the bay and then the Sauros here, the tomb of the Athenians rising in the plain. Okay. This is from 1835. Now one of the things that Chandler is sad not to see are these pillars that inscribe the names of the Athenian dead. So that's what he, you know, he wanted to find those on top of the mound and he couldn't find them. And um, the reason for their absence um, seems to have been solved in 2000. And that's when um, casualty lists, so a list of the dead for the Erechtheus tribe, so one of the 10 tribes of, Ar of Athens, was discovered at a private villa of a guy called Herodes Atticus, who was an Athenian magnate and Roman citizen of the second century AD. And it was found about 200 mile kilometers from Marathon in the Peloponnese, right? So it seems that he had taken these memorials from the tomb of the Athenians and taken them to his private villa in the Peloponnese, 200 kilometers away. Um, so who was he? He was this obscenely wealthy benefactor um, from the Dean of Marathon, but also with a Roman, so with Roman citizenship. He was the Greek tutor for the emperors Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus. Um, and he traced his descent to Miltiades and Cimon, right? So he traced his descent to the great, to the general of Marathon. And he also owned much of the Dean of Marathon at the time, which is probably why he felt that he could take this memorial that was more important to him than it was to the Athenians. Um, So he takes it, this is him, this is our, we have lots of representations of him and he always looks like this, which is a little bit evil, I think. There's an evil look to his eye. So he takes it from Marathon all the way down to his like, private villa over here in the Peloponnese, which is you know, a, a feat in itself. And he probably had all 10 of the casualty lists, so we've only found one, but he probably had all 10. Um, so what does this casualty list tell us? So it's not just a list of inscribed names, okay? It also has this epigram on it, and the epigram speaks of the glory of the dead of the, the, um, the Athenians who fought at Marathon. And it says, I declare, whoever dwells beneath dawn at the ends of the earth will learn of the arites, of the excellence, the virtue, the valour of these men, how they died, fighting the means, and how they, how they crowned Athens having taken on the war a few against many. Right, so this is written in honor of the, um, of the Athenian dead. And it's really kind of, it's an interesting layout as 
world. You can see that it's sort of laid out so that you get the impression that you might be able to read the list of names kind of diagonally, downwards, upwards, in all sorts of directions. So it has this, this kind of, it makes you want, want to look at it and try and work it out. Um, and it sort of mimics the way um, you build with bricks, right, where you put um, one row of bricks and then you offset the next type of brick. So it has this idea of a monument kind of built into it. And it also mimics the way the hoplites would have lined up in the, um, in the army as well. So it kind of builds all these kinds of ideas of this battle into it, into its own monumentality. And it's also um, really nice in that it seems to match up with texts that we already have. So we have Herodotus um, telling us about the invasion of the Persians in Greece. Um, he tells us that the Delphic Oracle um, says to the Athenians when they go and ask what should we do, the Persians are coming, um, what, what should we do? This is after the Battle of Marathon, this is when they're coming um, in 480, 479. Um, and the Delphic Oracle says to them, wretches, why do you ling linger here? Rather flee from your houses and city, flee to the ends of the earth. From the circle, from circle in battle with Athens, um, and the phrase like "flees to the end of the, wood, the earth" is exactly the same one that's used here. That talks about you know even someone at the ends of the earth is going to hear about the the great honour and reputation of the Athenians who did who stayed to fight. So it seems to kind of build a response to the Delphic Oracle in it. So it's a really nice example where we have a um, a material artifact that lines up with the, the literature and the history that we have at the time. And also it tells you that this would have been put up after the Battle of Salamis because it's referencing something that's referring to that. So possibly the memorial was damaged when the Persians came the second time. So why does he take them there? Well, it's a good question. Um, it seems that he is, he's, he's kind of trying to set himself up as a new hero of Marathon and kind of a new Theseus. So he sort of sees that he's like the inheritor of the Marathon legend. So he takes it to his private house and he sets it up with all sorts of representation of his family and also other important Greek people from around the empire and also emperors as well. Um, so he sort of constructs this, um, this museum of heroic virtue and Greekness in his own private villa for his own benefit, in a way. So he's also kind of tapping into the idea of Marathon being the great symbol of um, you know, Greek virtue and Greek excellence, but then taking it for himself and putting it in his own private villa. So Marathon is kind of the central, the most important aspect of this, in a way. So, Chandler's upset that he can't find these, um, these casualty lists, and now we know that he can't find them because Herodes Atticus stole them. Um, when Dodwell comes in 1806, he tries to also verify Pausanias, but he goes beyond Chandler and does a bit of amateur archaeology. Okay, so he also notes kind of the tradition of travel and, and the way people have sort of understood the plane before him. So he said, you know, the Marathon plane has been often described by um, ancient as well as by modern authors, that a detailed account of it in this place could be a little more than repetition of what others have said. So I'm, the, I'm going to find, confine myself to a few necessary observations about this memorable spot. So he says, the plane is about five miles in length, two in breadth. Um, it's at present composed of corn and pasture land. The countrymen were reaping the corn and a great quantity of cattle were feeding in the uncultivated parts. A large tumulus of earth rises in the middle and near the sea close to the marsh, marsh are two others composed of small stones and much lower than the former. Pausanias mentions two sepulchres in the plain, um, that of the Athenians and that of the Boeotians and slaves, besides the monument of Miltiades. And the same author conjectures that the Persians were buried in a pit because he couldn't find a tumulus erected over. And he says, the great tumulus has been opened, but without success, because it wasn't ex excavated to a sufficient, sufficient depth. And it should be noted that he's speculating here, because no one has dug far enough, but he thinks that if you do dig far enough, then you're going to find the bodies of the Athenians, basically. Um, it's 
singular that no ancient armour has ever been found in the plain, nor scarcely any relics of the many thousands who perished in this memorable field. Time may bring to light some interesting particulars, and a proper examination of the tumuli would be productive of objects of interest to the antiquarian and historian. I found in the large tumulus some fragments of coarse pottery and a great many small arrowheads of black flint, which probably belonged to the Persian army. Okay, so you can see that he's really looking for some kind of concrete sign, some kind of material object to say this is, this is the place, this is where it all happened. This is you know, the place that means so much. And what he finds are these sort of these four small um, stone arrowheads. So Dugwell says that he you know, digs about in the tumulus and he's not the first to do so. So you can see from this um, 19th century image that you've got some people on a day out at Marathon and they've come along with their picks and you know, they've dug up a little amphora, a pot over here as well. So it was like the thing to do is to go and find some antiquities in the plain of Marathon that you could say, you know, maybe this was connected with battle. And there were excavations that predate Dodwell being there. Um, so Felvel, who was the French consul in Athens in 1788, um, undertook an eight-day excavation where he didn't find anything but did leave a big hole in the actual Soros. <laughs> Um, and then Edward Clark was there in 1801, and he was really critical of Favelle because he thought he didn't dig deep enough. Um, but And he, like Dodwell, only found these kind of stone arrowheads. Um, and he takes this kind of really interesting... Uh, his, his conclusion to his visit to Marathon basically um, talks about his expectation that the local inhabitants will exploit the rich soil agriculturally whenever, and this is a quote, whenever they shall be delivered from Turkish tyranny. So he kind of sees the, um, the promise of Marathon can only really be realised once Greece is free of Turkish domination. So it points to the travellers linking the Battle of Marathon with the need to liberate present day Greece as well um, from Ottoman rule and introduces the idea that um, freedom will somehow make them more attuned to their own land and also more competent in its curation. So they'll be able to look after the land, land better as well when they're, when they're free. Um, and then you get Lord and Lady Elgin who come in 1802 and they go specifically to look for weapons but they don't find any. They just again find these little arrowheads. So if you take a closer look at Dodwell in 1806, um, following his excavations, he then starts to theorise about the arrowheads that he found. Um, and he says that, you know, if he found them in the tumulus, they probably belonged to the Persian army. And he says, according to the testimony of Herodotus, the Ethiopians who formed part of the army of Xerxes in Greece had darts, the heads of which, instead of iron, were of pointed stone. So he's making this connection now with Herodotus. And what Herodotus actually says is, the Ethiopians were wrapped in skins of leopards and lions and carried bows made of palm, palm wood strips, no less than four cubits long, and short arrows pointed not with iron, but with sharpened stone that they used to carve seals. Furthermore, they had spears pointed with a gazelle's horn sharpened like a lance and also studded clubs. So it's like this description of um, Herodotus that they're basing this idea that these arrowheads must be Ethiopian. Now, importantly, Herodotus is talking about Xerxes' invasion of 480 to 479, so the second invasion, not about the Battle of Marathon in 490. But Dogwell has this real desire to make this kind of solid artifact-based connection, and it overrides this detail. Right? So there's something about this kind of the haptic experience, the experience of touching these arrowheads that the travellers really revel in. And they, it's almost like they act as a direct connection between the, to the battle and to the past, a way of making it real and present. So Dogwell then uses this deduction about Ethiopians to sort of correct and expand on Pausanias's description. And he does it through the cult statue of Nemesis at, Ram, at Ramnus. And this is a sanctuary that's not very far from Marathon and is associated by Pausanias with the famous battle, because we all know Nemesis is you know, the goddess of retribution. Um, so Pausanias says that the punishment of Nemesis, the specially implacable goddess to wicked and violent men, 
found, fell on the barbarians, meaning the Persians, who landed at Marathon. They were sure that nothing would stop them from taking Athens, so they carried a block of Parian marble to fashion into a trophy for their deeds. Phidias worked this block into the statue of Nemesis. Okay, so not only did Nemesis um, fall on them in retribution, but the, thing that they, the stone they brought for a trophy actually became the cult statue of Nemesis. And so by Pausanias' day, the sanctuary of Nemesis at Ramnus was really inseparable from the Battle of Marathon, even though it was founded probably uh, well over a century beforehand, but it was sort of connected so closely to the battle that people started to think it was founded after the battle. And Pausanias told, tells us that the um, statue of Nemesis um, wore a crown on her, her head which had deer on it and small images of victory of Niki. And in her left hand she held an, an apple branch and in her right was a cup on which there were Ethiopians. Um, as to the Ethiopians, he says, I could hazard no guess myself, nor could I accept the statement of those who are convinced that the Ethiopians have been carved upon the cup because of the river ocean, because of the river ocean. Um, for the Ethiopians, they say, dwell near it, and Ocean is the father of Nemesis. Okay, so Pausanias is trying to work out why there are Ethiopians on this cup. Um, Dodwell uses this, um, the artifacts that he found in the tomb of the Athenians in the Sauros to kind of rectify Pausanias' story. Okay. So um, he tells us that, you know, Ethiopians were represented on the cup, which was in the right hand of the statue of Nemesis, Pausanias can't account for this, he's at a loss, um, but the reason seems evident to me, because uh, I found these arrowheads that belong to the, to the Ethiopians. So clearly, the Ethiopians are on the cup because the Ethiopians were 40, for 40 were fighting against um, the Athenians at Marathon. Right. And he, has a, he knows this because he has this <coughs> solid evidence, he has this, these arrowheads. So he kind of creates this whole story based on his amateur archaeology and his reading of the landscape through Pausanias. Um, he does tell us though, you know, it's the only part of Greece where I found arrowheads of flint. Um, those of bronze are common on the spots where battles have been fought. Um, they're generally not about a, more than an inch in length. Um, they're also almonds of lead and also are sometimes found in the plain and in different parts of Attica. Um, and they're generally not much larger than the fruit of the shell. Um, they were used by slingers and are sometimes inscribed. So the ones I've published here were found at Athens. Its um, inscription may be a proper name or perhaps um, a composite epithet signifying illustrious in victory. So that's like Cleonicus, right? illustrious, illustrious in victory. Another is double the usual side, and on one side is inscribed Dexai, receive it, and on the other is a thunderbolt in relief. Okay, so he's are finding all these signs of battles in the landscape along with these, um, these arrowheads. And I think it's quite nice that the, the Greeks were writing these messages on their, you know, their projectiles, like, you know, here, take that as well at the time. So Dodwell's interpretation that the flint arrowheads belonged to the Persians um, led to the idea that the Soros was the burial place of the Persians for a while. Um, Colonel Leake, however, in 1841, in his publication, decided that they were probably more likely to be offerings to the fighters of Marathon, so to the Athenians. So they were put into the tomb of the Athenians as offerings. So he travelled around Greece and surveyed it in the first decade of the 19th century and he published his first topography of Athens in 1821. And his second volume, the second volume of it sees him visit Marathon and he approaches the landscape again with Pausanias. So he really bases his kind of method of, of exploring Greece on Pausanias and then kind of use, uses <coughs> coins and inscriptions and those sorts of things to supplement it. So he notes that, he notes that um, at the tumulus, which he calls Soror, the tomb, um, that, and he thinks that that was probably the name given it to it right from the beginning, right, that people of Athens have always called call it that. He describes it in detail, and then he says that, um, 
that he found some bronze arrowheads, but in a much greater number he found fragments of black flint that were rudely shaped and which in general are longer than the arrowheads of brass. And he says all of these were probably discharged by the Persian bowmen and having been collected after the action were thrown into the grave of the Athenians as an offering to the victorious dead. Um, and they thus received the first marks of these heroic honours which were ever afterwards paid to them by the Marathonians. Um, in his second edition later, he says that actually they might be natural formations because um, they have been found in other places. So he sort of revises, he's not really sure they are arrowheads. Um, but that doesn't really matter because uh, he doesn't, you know, he wants to find the signs of the battle. So they are, they, they are arrowheads to everyone who's really interested in this Soros. So it became so common for travellers to come to Marathon looking for traces of the battle and you know, demand for Marathon memorabilia was so high that there were all these unofficial excavations happening at the Soros. And it got to the point where it started to look a little bit like an erupted volcano just from people digging into it so much. Right. It had this really deep crater. So you know, there's this great monument to Greek glory and to, to um, fighting off the, this eastern threat and they're just sort of destroying it by looking for the signs of it, the concrete signs. And all of this was of course happening against the background of the Greek War of Independence um, in the first part of the 19th century. And the war for Greek freedom really powerfully informs the desire of Western Europeans to find this kind of concrete evidence for the burial place of the Athenians at Marathon. And this really brings me back to this image here, which is not only tapping into the connection of Marathon with Greek freedom, um, but also Pausanias' description of the plain as haunted. Right, so Miltiades here, this ghost with his toga and helmet, um, Hematian and helmet, um, <laughs> Um, might be one of these ghosts that Pausanias says haunts the plain and fights every night that you might come across. Right. So the connection of Marathon with Greek freedom both in 490 BC and in the Greek War of Independence was sort of solidified after the conclusion of the war when on the 12th of May in 1836 the Greek Minister of Education who was responsible for cultural affairs sent a decree to the Provisional Directorate of Attica prohibiting any further unauthorised excavation of the Soros. Um, and the reason for that was because of its cultural significance. So he described it as the most ancient monument of Greek glory. So you can't have this monument being destroyed by people looking for weapons or signs or bodies at all. It has to be preserved. Okay, so that sort of concluded these efforts of trying to dig into it. So despite this sort of official attempt to you know, crystallise this, this legend of Marathon in the tomb of the Athenians, it was like the main sign of the battle on the plain, the exploration did continue. Um, so George Finlay, an Englishman in 1838, sort of also went to look at the, um, the tumulus and sort of discovered that there was a mix of layers in it. So you know, he, he thought that, you know, that this was probably very well maybe the tomb of the Athenians, but there are probably also other burials in here. So was this, this, that maybe other people would come back later wanting to add themselves to the story as well, to bury themselves in there. So he found this sort of mixed layering of the, the um, soil. Um, and he thought that the Ethiopian arrowheads were probably actually older um, and that were found elsewhere in um, Attica where Persian invasion hadn't happened, but not at places like the Mopoli and Plataea. So he sort of decided these arrowheads probably had nothing to do with the Battle of Marathon. But that didn't matter because he was still certain that the Soros was connected to the Battle of Marathon. And um, 20th century archaeological work has sort of verified this and they've actually decided that these flint arrowheads were obsidian flakes of Neolithic or Bronze or the Bronze Age. Um, so probably nothing to do with the Battle of Marathon. But so many, you know, so many people over so many centuries saw them as these really strong signs of Marathon, as connecting themselves in their moment on the plane to that battle. The 
making it present. There was also then a official, um, another official excavation in um, 1889 to 1891, and this was by Valerius Stace, and he um, did what Clark had sort of suggested back in 1801, and that was dig below the level of the plane. So dig into the, the tumulus and go below the level of the plane. And he went 13 feet below it, and he found two brick offering trenches covered by a layer of ash with charged bird and animal bones and possibly some human bones. Um, and you know, and these, these were kind of common features of sort of aristocratic burials in Attica in the 6th century BC. He also found 34 vessels, so vases or pots, um, mostly of black figure decoration dating from about 570 BC up to 490 BC. Um, so these are also kind of common in archaic burials um, as well. But it's been interpreted as being solid evidence that this was the mound that held 192 Athenians. Okay. Um, and it's been, the, the fact that some of these, these pots dated to 570 has sort of been dis explained as um, these, these guys are really special. What they did was so special that they got a heroic burial. And so anyone who had Anyone who wanted to make an offering to them didn't just get their, you know, the, the dish they had that they were using for breakfast. They went and got the one that they'd had in their family for generations that was really special to them. And they gave that to the, um, the dead at Marathon. And, you know, and Thucydides tells us that they were treated specially as well. So they weren't buried in the Demosian Sema, in the city cemetery in Athens. They were buried on the battlefield because they were so special, because they were heroes. So they had to be singled, singled out and treated in a special kind of way. So this source seems to have had a quite a complicated history. Um, so maybe it began as a prehistoric mound. Maybe it was used for some kind of archaic burials or early classical burials, burials probably for the, the dead at Marathon as well. Um, there are some like late Roman tombs near the top, evidence of that. Um, so it seems to have been a place where pe that people wanted to associate themselves with when they died to be remembered. And the, um, the dead of Marathon were kind of the real calling card there, the thing that, that drew people to this place, to this tomb, to this tomb, sorry. And this cultural desire is kind of summed up really nicely by Colonel Leake. So he says, so despite the piecemeal and, oh sorry, so he says, this heap of earth covers the remains of 192 heroes who purchased with their lives a victory the most remarkable for the disproportion of the parties engaged that history has recorded. A victory which may be said to have affected the arts, policy and civilization of Europe from that time to the present day. Right, so it really is, you know, the most ancient monument of Greek glory, as the Greek Minister of Education said. Um, and this is, you know, Leek says this after he's realised that the arrowheads are probably have nothing to do with Marathon. So, you know, he's still, you know, this is the this is the sign of um, the heroic um, deeds of the Athenians that kept us from becoming Persian slaves. So despite you know, this sort of not entirely inconclusive excavational work on the, the tomb of the Athenians, its identity as the tomb of the Athenians has never really been in doubt. Um, it was confirmed already in the second century AD by Pausanias, who was looking for concrete signs of his own Greek culture in the Roman present, um, by early European travellers um, who agreed with him um, by interpreting the landscape that they found through his lens and also official excavations that have added further weight by highlighting the kind of exceptional nature of the dead of Marathon, um, which also Thucydides had told us about already. Okay. So that features of the Soros resemble earlier archaic aristocratic burials as signs that you know, the dead of Marathon were buried in a special way they were buried as heroes. And one of the most kind of remarkable aspects of this process is, I think, is really our human need for concrete signs by which to connect more meaningfully with the past and to funnel our emotional investment in it. 
because we all do have kind of an emotional connection to the past and to and we can usually invest that into sort of objects that tell us about the past. Okay. And that really is the, you know, the function of any wall memorial or any tomb. Um, so the Soros at Marathon is really just an aggrandised version of a war memorial. Um, and it funnels the cultural longings of anyone who identifies and finds value in Greece, her legends, her culture and her legacy. Thank you. the situation with the Soros today? Is it protected by fencing or? Yeah, it's protected by... It's got video like, cameras? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I mean, it's protected by a sort of an outside fence, but um, you can go into it and get up close to it. I don't think you can walk over it anymore. You used to be able to. Um, but you can get quite close to it now. So you can get, you know, within five metres or so of it. But you, yeah. but you can only go... In, you can only go in at certain times when there are guards there who are watching your every move. So if you bring a shovel, they may not let you in. <laughs> Because <laughs> <laughs> symbolism is more important yeah. than you know, 